style it pretty much the same way that we can style anything. We can put a style in by the particular tags. So here I gave a style on the table, or TD, or TH, or caption. I also gave a style for class. So for example, these couple of entries I decided were special. They represented like the high value for that column, or whatever, or row. And therefore, I gave them a class of high bill. And then I can highlight it some way. All right. Uh, again, if we're going to use color to highlight, remember that accessibility tells us that we should also set it apart a different way. So maybe color and italics would be a good way to set it apart. And I think that's what we did. We did. Any questions about this? All right. I'm going to go and I'm going to add some more columns here just to make for a bigger table. Actually, I'm going to add more rows, not more columns. And I'm going to cheat a little bit rather than putting in a specific month, I'm just going to put in X's like that, indicating, well, I don't know, it's some month. Then I'm going to copy this row a bunch of times. So we have a lot of rows in this table. OK. So if we look at the table now, one thing that happens with a big table, especially if it's a big table that is also wide, so like especially if there were more columns in this table, is that your eye tends to move up or down a little bit. It's hard to keep your eye steady going across the page, and you run the risk that your eye is going to shift a little bit, and you might actually think that for this month, this is the value, when actually it's this value. One thing that we can do to prevent that is to alternate color lines in our table. Uh, this is something that they used to do in the old days with the paper for computer printouts. It's called green bar paper. And you probably saw this. Or maybe you saw this. Computer paper looked like this. All right, where there were green bars. And the alternating green and white bars helped you see so your eye wouldn't drift either up or down. So we're going to try to do something similar to that in our table. All right, And there's ways that we could do it using the CSS that we already know, but there's a neat little trick that makes it even, even easier. So if I look at CSS table alternating row color, they can do something like this. And what they can do is you can say, that even rows. We want the background color to be that. All right? So if we look at our table, that gives us sort of, instead of green bar, that gives gray bar. Now, that might be a little hard to see. And also, 
if I'm going to do this, I wouldn't want the month name to be in that darker color because that kind of spoils the effect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this to say, instead of th, I'm going to say th dot. top row. Now, this is where I can see where it gets a little confusing. Because if I say th top row, that's a little different than th nth child. That's a colon. This is a period. A period represents a class. So I have to define top row. Whereas in this case, nth child even is something that's already predefined. So it's a little bit different. Whenever you see a period, it means, again, that that's a class that I would have to make. So in this case, I'm going to give all the THs in the top row that class. And the other one, the rest of the THs, the, the row headers, I'm not going to do anything with, so they get the color of the row that they're in. So that makes it a little harder, or easier to read, rather. The lines can also make it a little easier to read. And I could put a border on the THs as well. So all THs have a border, but only the THs in the top row have the special coloring. Now I would have to judge, is that dark enough to really tell? On the screen, it might be a little hard to tell if that is, uh, that that's gray. So we could make it a little bit darker. All right. Remember, E8 is a lower number than F2, because F is higher than E. It's just like comparing numbers. 96 is higher than 88. Why? You compare the 9 to the 8. And oh, the 9 is higher. So you don't even have to look at the rest of them. So F is higher than E. So F2 is higher than E8, which means that E8 is going to be a little bit darker number. Maybe that looks good. Um, maybe I'll darken this a little bit. All right. And again, we can play with it any way we want to. As a throwback, I'm going to make it actually green, even if it is a pale green. as I thought it would be. All right, there we go. All right, I like that. So we'll stick with that. Questions over this? One digit is zero to F, right? A, B, after nine is A, B, C, D, E, F. All Fs would be purely white, because it would be all the numbers it would be. I, I think of this as light shining on a screen. So if all the, again, you, 
it, you best to view these as three separate numbers. The first one is how much red there is. The second one is how much green there is. The third one is how much blue there is. So this one has a pretty good amount of red and blue and more green. So I can tell by the fact that this is a bigger number than this that it's going to be greenish tint. All right. Those other two are equal, so it's going to be a grayish green. All right. If those numbers were really high, so for example, if these were we had FF F0 F0 then this would be a very light shade of green all right because almost to the point of being white we just have a little less red and a little less blue so it is greenish tint Anyhow, did that answer your question? Yeah. Good. The nice thing about this is, is like I've said before, is if this is confusing to you, uh, you kind of don't have to worry about it because you can look it up on a chart and get the colors that you want. As long as you know, hey, that is going to be. That's a hexadecimal number. It's three pairs. And I'll, OK. All right, there we go. OK. Onward and upward. The next thing that you can do is you can group the rows of the table into a head, a body, and a foot, footer, just like you have your page has a head, a body, and a footer. And you can do that for a couple reasons. One of the reasons you can do that is for styling. Oh, what an ugly table. So you can use the T head to go around the header section. So you can say this row is the header. All these rows here are the body of the table. Now, if I had a totals, if I had a totals row, which I'm going to add in a minute here, I would put that in a T foot. And this is useful for a couple reasons. It's useful for styling. And it's useful sometimes with accessibility. Screen readers, it's good if screen readers know what a head, header row is and what a footer row is, because it can treat them differently. Well, it doesn't really change anything terribly much for this. All right? It added the total row. But I can do some styling then with it. 
For example, this gives you the hook to style these THs differently. So I don't need a class anymore for these. What would I say instead of having a class here? Yeah, I would say exactly. I would say inside the T head, any TH gets styled that way. And it works the same way. Then I could do something like T foot and maybe give it a different background. Unless you style it. Yeah, unless you, unless you style it. But the foot tag gives you a chance to easily say, OK, well, this one I want to have a background of. And I'll make a background of a different shade of gray just to differentiate it between the header. Okay. And then maybe I can make the color of that white. something like that. Notice what we have is we have sort of competing um, styles here. I have a color on the TD, and I have a color on the T foot. Well, the TD is closer to this content than the T foot is, right? The T foot's up here, the TD is here. So it gives me the style of the TD. I could change that by just saying T foot TD. color white. And we have it like that. Questions about this? All right, the last thing that we're going to talk about is accessibility. Now, what is the access? What is the accessibility issue with tables? The, the issue is sort of the same thing with forms, right? With forms, people that can see can easily just look at and say, hey, that label is next to that text box. So those two must go together. They just, they just know that. They don't have to, like if you go into Canvas, for example. off. How do you log off? All right. Oh, they don't have labels here. Yeah, they have placeholders. Yeah. Yeah, I, I suppose. Um, Email or phone. They've shown that. Um, at any rate, typically with a form, you know 
that the label belongs to the form control because it's right next to it. People that can see know that this is for this column because they can see a cross. That's food, that's this month. Okay? So they, you don't have to help them out, they can see. With a screen reader, you have to sort of supply uh, a little bit of help. And you do that by putting a scope column, a uh, scope attribute on the header. So, the scope attribute says that this th is the header for this column. So, month is the header for this column. Savings is the header for that column. You can tell that by the scope. All right? So in this case, I would say that the TH is a header for this column. And the screen reader software will pick that up and will help a person be able to identify that that's the header for that column. So if, they're, they're, if it's being read to them, the value of that column, the label, the text associated with that column header will be available to them. And the same thing for row, too. A, a row header, you can say scope equals row. Because really, January is sort of the header of each row. The month is sort of the header for each row. So I'm only going to go and do the first one, but, or the first couple, but you would do all of these. Actually, I lied. I'll do them all. So it's important to do that to make your table accessible. To people that don't use screen readers, there's no visible change to the page, but it does make it more accessible. Other things you can do to make your page, your table more accessible. One is don't do anything too complicated with the table. All right? What do I mean by things too complicated? Well, you can actually put tables inside of table cells. So, for example, I could put inside of the food cell, I could put a little table that said how much I spent on groceries, how much I spent eating out, how much I spent at fast food, and I could categorize my food expenses and have a little table inside of that that broke down food expenses. That's very complicated. Uh, both for people that are using assistive technology and people that aren't. And it makes very complicated code to read, all right, uh, and, and change. So keep your tables simple. Avoid nested tables. Avoid spanning columns. You can actually say that one TD spans two columns by saying call span equals two, or you can say row span equals two. That makes the, the table a little more complicated, and I would avoid doing that. All right? So keep the table simple. Use tables only for data, and use the scope attribute are the three main things that you can do to help with the accessibility of them.
questions on these? All right, JavaScript. We're going to do just enough JavaScript, I hope, to make you curious about what else you can do with JavaScript. Um, if you remember, back when we drew our diagram about the client and the server, we said that here you are, the client. And typically, your person is on a computer or maybe a mobile de device. And you're running a web browser. And you're connected to the internet through the cloud. And at the other end is a web server. And you request web pages that makes it to the server. And the server responds with a web page. And it responds with a mix of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and like images and so on. And we said that a lot of times servers don't have completed HTML pages, but computers run a computer program. The server runs a computer program that process written in PHP or whatever that the server processes and interacts with the database maybe and creates on the fly a page that matches your request. So if I Google HTML, there's not an HTML Google page sitting out there waiting. All right? That Google page is assembled by the web server and delivered to you. And it looks at both what you've typed in the form and other information about you, like locations, where you're at and so on. So it's really amazing that that, that that happens so rapidly. All right, It really is something to think that when I go type it in, there's a web page made just for me that contains that information. Well, exactly. But it's not very long. Oh, they do tell you, right. Now, we can do this because this is a computer. And it can run programs. All right? So it can do a lot more than simply take a finished HTML page and deliver it. It can actually create that HTML page. All right? Now, the idea for JavaScript is similar, except for a small thing. In this case, yes, this is a computer or maybe a smartphone. All right? And it can run programs, too. And it can run code. But instead of to create a brand new page, we're going to alter the page that got delivered some way. So think of the server-side script as being code written to create web pages and send them to the client. Whereas the JavaScript, sometimes JavaScript you'll refer to as client-side scripting because it's run within the client's browser. All right? And its job is typically to alter a page that's already been delivered. All right? So that's the difference in roles. Now, I realize this is sort of a big generalization, but I think it's effective to kind of communicate the differences. So let's go to ESPN. Hopefully, there's nothing controversial and people aren't hitting themselves with football helmets or each other with football helmets or anything like that. ESPN.com. <coughs> I make that request. I get sent to the web server, and their database is inquired, all right? 
and because there isn't someone going in to change the web page because these scores, right? And you know, if you if you were watching this last night, if you went to the page and came back 10 minutes later, it would show the score is different, right? There isn't a web developer going in and changing the HTML for that. There's some sort of program that can read a database that can update this. All right? If we came tonight, there's going to be different scores up there, right? And again, it's not because there's a web developer changing the web page on the server. There's code that pulls from a database the scores. So the server did its thing and sent us the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript for this page. So the server looked up in databases and did everything it had to do to produce this web page. And it sent us content that we see, and it also sent us stuff that we don't see. Okay? Because really, there's only a limited amount of space on a screen, especially when you think of a, a handheld device, a mobile device. So, for example, let's look at these menus. It says NFL, NBA, NCAA football, NCAA M. Men's basketball, maybe? I don't know. Soccer, MMA. If we put our mouse over it, a menu appears. Now let's notice something about the menu appearing. First of all, when I requested the page, how long did it take? Not long, but we can see the page loading. So it took a second, half second, I don't know. It took a certain amount of time for this page to, a request to make it to the server, the server to do its thing with it, and then to respond. So it's a little bit of time for the page to redraw itself. When I put my mouse on there, whoops. How long does it take to appear? It's instantaneous. All right? That's one hint that this is something different than a request to the server. All right? Because this happens instantaneously. In other words, to get those menus to appear, that all happens on this computer. And anything that happens on this computer can happen much quicker than to go all the way through the internet to the server and back. All right? Because that's quick. It's not long. But this, if everything is executing on this computer, is going to be way, way, way quicker. All right? So that's a hint that something different is going on here. The other hint that something different is going on here is if we look very closely, we don't see that a new page is being loaded. It just appears. Whereas if I request a page, we get a little message down there saying what's happening, that it, we're sending the request, that we're waiting for the response, and so on and so on. So we're not getting back stuff from the server in this case. We are simply, as we put our mouse over things, those menus are appearing. All right? That's happening on the client side. It doesn't require a trip through the internet. That's a win-win situation. All right? It's a win for the client because they get a quicker response. All right? They don't have to sit there and wait for a few seconds for the request to go to the server and to come back. They get a response like this. It's also a win for the server, because the server doesn't have to deal with all these little requests to show this menu or show that menu or something like that. Now, especially with traditional web pages, there is 
an exception to this, but when you request from a server, you get back an entire page. And here, we're not getting back a whole page. We're just making visible a section of the page that was invisible before. So when we request this page initially, we get all this content that we see along with content that we don't see. And then we have JavaScript whose job it is to show and hide those menus. All right? How do we show or hide menus? How do we hide something on our page? For, go ahead. Display none, right? How do we show something? Display block, all right? So what's happening is as the user does something, the properties of the CSS are either are changed one way or another. Okay? So let's write a real simple JavaScript. I started a little bit late, so I'll go a little, little long today. Let's write a real simple JavaScript example. Uh, why don't I? That's a good question. Uh, it's easy, especially for students and for people that haven't studied HTML and understand it, it's easy for people to let the tool do the work for you and not really understand it. And if you use visual tools to design your page, so something like Dreamweaver, all right, uh, it, uh, you run the risk of going down the path of least resistance and developing code that doesn't take truly the advantages of, that you'd get from good, well-written HTML. It, it, it's kind of the analogy that I would give is it's kind of the difference between someone that would bake a cake from scratch versus using a, a box cake. All right? Yeah, box, box cake is a little easier, and it's probably still going to be good. But it probably won't be as good as a good pastry chef that went and made everything from scratch. All right? Now, to be sure, with Visual Studio, um, you, you, know, you can still type in the code. Right? You don't have to use the visual part of it to, to do that. Um, but in an intro class, I don't necessarily like to have people worrying and fighting with the, the IDE. I'd rather have them focusing on just the code itself. So even in Java classes, we just use, we just use a plain text editor to start out. Because uh, it's my experience that like in intro to programming classes, that, that people can use uh, the IDEs as a little bit of a crutch and they don't know how to do something without using an IDE. So I want to make sure that people understand it before we introduce IDEs. OK? All right. So let's go in and edit this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make real quickly. An unordered list that contains a couple items.
I'm just going to make some links. And then I'm going to make a sort of a sub menu underneath that. So without any CSS, it looks like this. All right, we have items and we have our sub items. I can go and I'm going to put the CSS right in this page just to be lazy. I could go and make those sub items disappear by putting in the CSS to hide them. This part you should know already. You should know how to create the uh, the HTML for a list of links. You should know how to use CSS to hide them. Now the last thing that I'm going to do is show it when the user mouses over the link. Review this again. It's gone. So now I'm going to show that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say what's going to trigger that displaying. On mouse over. And what do I want to do on mouse over? I want to find the thing that has an ID of sub item one. I want to change its style. What about the, how do I want to change its style? I want to change the display property. And what do I want to change it to? I want to just change it to block. OK, so we have a user action. That's what starts the ball rolling. The user puts their mouse on the item. We then point to the thing that we want to change with document get element by ID sub item. And then we say what we want to change about it. We want to change the style. We want to change the display to block. So now, if we go and view this, it's hidden. We put our mouse on it. It shows. All that ESPN example is, is a very elaborate version of that, okay, with just a lot more style and a lot more content going in. The thing that we didn't do is we didn't make it so it disappears again when we take our mouse out. But that would be on mouse out. We'll talk about that next week. All right. I did want to introduce this to you. And if you're a little fuzzy about what I covered today, that's OK. We'll spend more time going over it on Monday. I just wanted to get through one simple example. All right. Questions? We'll see you up in lab.